Nigel Farage dedicated his life to getting Britain out of the EU, and in 2016, he came one step closer to getting his wish when the country narrowly voted to leave. And then at the end of 2020, that dream finally became a reality when the UK officially left the European Union. Three years on, how is Farage feeling about his greatest success? On BBC Newsnight, Victoria Derbyshire put that question to him. A poll from last month showed that this is a general Brexit question. 53% of people say it was wrong to Brexit. That was a poll last mm. month. Around one in five Leave voters regret it. The OBR forecasts a 4% hit to the economy <laughs> over the medium <laughs> to long term. Don't make me laugh on Hang that. Hang on, yeah. four, that's 40 billion in tax revenues. Comical. The UK economy is the only G7 economy not back to its pre-pandemic size. Business investment has lagged behind comparable economies. Economically, the UK would have been better staying in, wouldn't it? I don't think that for a moment. But what I do Based think... Based on all that. But what, I do, but what I do think is we haven't actually benefited from Brexit economically, what we could have done. I mean, what Brexit's proved, I'm afraid, is that our politicians are about as useless as the commissioners in Brussels were. We've mismanaged this totally. And if you look at simple things, simple things uh, such as takeovers, such as corporation tax, we are driving business away from our country. Arguably, now we're back in control... We're regulating our own businesses even more than they were okay. as EU members. Brexit has failed. For you then? Well, I wouldn't root it out. It's not top of my bucket list, but frankly, we've not delivered on borders. We've not delivered on Brexit. The Tories have let us down very, very badly. We have a government stacked full of Brexit headbangers. Brexiteers have been in charge since 2019. And the Tories' whole parliamentary majority is based on an influx of hard right MPs voted in on the promise of an oven ready Brexit deal. And yet, somehow, that's not enough. Let's take a look at something Farage promised back in 2017. Tony, if Brexit is a disaster, I will go and live abroad. I'll go and live somewhere else. But do you know no, what, no, Tony? No, no. Do you know no. what, Tony? It isn't going to be a disaster. Someone tell me where Nigel Farage lives right now, because I suspect he splits his time between Britain and elsewhere. Ash, where are you on this? Was Brexit a disaster because of the people orchestrating it? Or was it because it was Brexit? Well, I think it's both. People voted Brexit for a variety of reasons, but a really big reason why many Labour voters, particularly outside of London, voted for Brexit was that I think that they had a really sincere belief that the state had failed to do anything for anybody, that we were stuck in a period of stagnation, if not decline, and that the establishment needed a kick up the arse in order to start getting things done. And so I think it felt a little bit like, you know, smacking the top of the TV to try and make it work again. They wanted to kick the levers of, of UK governance out of this horrible inertia. And that's not something that happened. Yes, Brexit delivered a massive political shock. Yes, you had a significant amount of political and electoral volatility. Ultimately, the state just kept on doing the thing that it was going to do, which is facilitate the extraction of money from workers and shoveling it towards people who were already wealthy. And that's because it was a conservative government. And that's because it was a conservative government, which, yes, was maybe leaning towards, you know, a little bit more intervention on the economy. But ultimately, they didn't want to, you know, mess with what existed too much. And I think also the fact that, you know, Boris Johnson was so ruthlessly defenestrated by his own party, it sort of meant that that, you know, leveling up conservatism was, you know, dead along with his career. So I think that that's one of the reasons why people voted Brexit and it didn't happen because you've had politics being captured so much by a particular economic orthodoxy that you weren't going to, I think, have the reversal of that flow of capital from workers towards the wealthy. I also think that it's inarguable that there was going to be a degree of economic downturn from leaving the EU. And I think that people who voted to leave the EU were well aware of that. I don't think that they voted leave because they thought it was going to be all sunlit uplands all the way. I think that people knew that if you vote to leave a trading block of 28 nations uh, who are geographically closest to you and also happen to be your biggest trading partners, that that's going to have an impact on growth. But 
I think that they thought that the return of sovereignty to the UK, the UK's own parliament being able to make its own laws was worth it. And I think that that's fine to make as a political calculation. I happen to vote Remain and I wanted to stay in the EU for immigration reasons to preserve freedom of movement. But I totally understand the calculation that people make, which is we're going to trade off economic growth to some degree for sovereignty. Now, again, we ha still have a massive democratic deficit in this country because of the electoral system we have, because of the way in which governments are able to ignore huge chunks of national opinion. I mean, the majority of conservative voters want to see the nationalization of public utilities like mail and water. And that's not something which is being reflected in either major party right now. So people are still significantly locked out of the political process and locked out of having their wishes, their preferences, their desires and their values reflected by the parties who control the boundaries of respectable opinion. And that's because that process of disenfranchisement didn't really have anything to do with the EU. It had everything to do with our electoral system, our media culture, and our political culture as well. And I think that there's another reason why Brexit will feel like a failure to many Brexiteers. Now, I'm not really talking about Nigel Farage here because he's a snake oil salesman. He was never going to say that Brexit was a success without him being captain of the ship. He's someone who has looked out first and foremost for his own political career and he used Brexit very effectively as a wedge which could break open a place for him within the top of British politics. He did that very successfully. But I think for lots of Brexiteers, the reason why they'll often go, they'll also go, well, hang on, we voted primarily on immigration and it's not achieved the results that we wanted. It's not delivered a low immigration, high wage economy. Well, there are reasons for that. We have an aging population. And so unless you have a significant amount of immigration effectively replenishing the workforce, you're going to end up with very low growth and a very high tax burden. That's the direction that we're going in anyway, even with immigration numbers, you know, on the increases we've seen. But that's a that's a fact of an aging population. We can't have the low birth rate and low immigration at the same time. It's just not something which you can, uh, you know, build an economic settlement on. The second thing is that the Brexit that was being demanded, which is, okay, well, we're going to get rid of all of these low wage workers who come from other countries, and we're going to replace them with high wage, so called high skilled workers from other countries, is that the other bit of that bargain, which is, and that means Brits have to take all those low wage jobs, was the part which was said in a whisper, because that's not a very appealing prospect at all. And I think we saw that with Suella Braverman's speech this week, where she was saying that it's going to have to be Brits who are picking fruit and veg and driving lorries and doing these other jobs. The National Farmers Union, alongside the government, actually ran a really massive campaign during the pandemic to try and get Brits into fruit and veg picking jobs because seasonal workers hadn't been able to travel combination of pandemic and Brexit. And there was remarkably little uptake. One, that's because fruit and veg picking, though derided as low skill, is actually very demanding work, very physically demanding, requires stamina, and also does require experience and skill. And two, the conditions of that work, the pay of that work, mean that if you already have a home in this country, a family, a social group, things that you want to do, it's not a great sell to go, okay, and now live in a shared caravan for months at a time. And you're not even guaranteed that work for the whole year. Whereas if you're somebody who comes from a different country, £11.50 an hour will go quite far if you send it back home. You'll go, okay, well, I'll take that on. This reality of a post-Brexit UK, which is both low wage and low immigration, simply cannot work. And it will not work. And that's the problem that the government is running into. That's the problem that people who voted Brexit are running into. And that's the problem that arch Brexiteers like Nigel Farage are running into because nobody looks at what we've got right now and goes, yeah, you know what? That's better than it was six or seven years ago. Nobody says that. Mm -hmm.